Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Napier. I work in a team at Google called Channel Intelligence uh, and we optimize and manage data feeds on behalf of large retailers like a lot of you out there today and in fact actually including some of you in the audience. Uh, I'm going to talk today about data feed best practices uh, but more specifically I'm going to help you answer the question how can I make sure my shopping feed is structured effectively. Now I've got quite a bit of content to get through in a relatively short amount of time so I'm going to move pretty quickly. I've been told that you can get these slides after the presentation, but I'll also be outside the auditorium uh, afterwards. Uh, if you've got any questions, please just come and find me uh, and I'll be happy to have a chat. So let's start with the basics. Number one, and it seems really obvious, but avoid having your account suspended in Google Merchant Center. It doesn't matter how well optimized your titles are, your descriptions, you might have beautiful high res images in your feed, uh, and you could have an incredibly sophisticated bidding strategy but if your account's suspended, none of that's going to matter and all that work's going to be wasted because none of your products are going to be live in the PLA auction. So it means complying with Google's policy requirements. Uh, and that means things like understanding any local restrictions in the markets that you operate in. Obviously, don't uh, advertise any dangerous uh, or restricted products uh, in your feed. Uh, be mindful of landing page restrictions. So don't have pop-ups blocking the content on your landing pages. And as well, don't require people to log in just to view your landing pages either. Uh, and also things like price and availability, which I'll talk about more in a little while, but just make sure that you keep those up to date. Number two is just get all of your products live, and this refers to what Nisha was talking about with the enormous number of products that are currently disapproved uh, in the Merchant Center. So it refers to item level or product level disapprovals. The best piece of advice I can give you regarding point number two is to review as often as possible, daily if possible, the Diagnostics tab in Merchant Center. Uh, the Diagnostics tab has improved significantly in the last 12 months or so. Uh, and in, in any given day now, you can see which of your products are disapproved, why they're disapproved. You can see all of the products uh, that have a warning for potential future disapproval uh, and the reasons for those. And it'll even give you some tips on how to optimize your feed, which brings me on to number three, optimizing your product content. Now, I'm going to spend most of my presentation today giving you specific tips on how you can optimize your feed. Uh, but effectively, the lower the data quality that you have in your feed, the higher you're going to have to bid just to maintain the same level of visibility. So it's really important, but as I said, I'll get onto that in just a second. Point number four is just to differentiate your PLAs. So how do you stand out amongst all of the other offers in the Google search results page or in Google Shopping? And there's a range of ways you can do this. So I'm talking about including ratings and reviews on your PLAs, uh, merchant promotions, so shoppers know uh, when you've got a specific deal or a sale on. Uh, things like local inventory ads, which Nisha pointed out, if you can take advantage of that, um, you know, that's obviously a great step forward. Uh, but also becoming a Google trusted store is also something that's uh, highlighted in your PLAs as well. So a range of ways uh, that you can differentiate yourself. Now, as I said, I'm going to start going through some specific uh, ways that you can optimize your feed. Before I do that, let me just give you some context around this seemingly random image that I've chosen here. Can anyone tell me what building this is? Correct. It's the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. Can anyone tell me who designed it? Frank Gehry. Correct. So when I was looking for an image for this slide, uh, this one jumped out at me and, and I recognized it straight away because my father's an architect and he loves Frank Gehry and he loves this building. Um, to him, this is absolutely representative of architectural best practice. Now to a lot of you out there, you're probably looking at this thinking, my father's crazy and it, it looks like a bunch of scrap metal just bolted together in a totally random way. And that's fine because architectural best practice uh, you know, like music, like any art form, is totally subjective. Uh, so it's, up, it's a matter of debate and, and up for opinion, uh, you know, you can voice your opinion on that. Uh, feed best practices and the tips that I'm about to run you through now are the opposite. So they're not up for debate and they're not subjective. And that's because they're validated by data that channel intelligence has collected uh, over the, and analysed over, the, over a number of years. Uh, so I'm going to run you through a few of those now. Um, consistently, these things have proven to uplift performance with statistical significance. So let's get into it. I'm going to start with titles, and I'll, I'll start with quite a simple one. If you've got highly recognizable brands uh, or well-known brands in your catalog, take the brand name and move it to the front of your title. Uh, it's really simple, but this consistently shows uplifts in not just impressions, but also clicks and conversions. And you can see the example I've got here, which is of a specific uh, channel intelligence customer. And when they went live with this optimization, there was an immediate uplift in impressions of about 50%. Uh, this one does come with a bit of a warning though. 
if your brands aren't highly recognisable or strong brands and you apply this technique, it can actually have a, detr a detrimental effect on performance. So you do need to make a judgement call based on the specific brands that you have in your catalogue. I'm going to stay on titles for a moment uh, and it's really important to make sure that all of the titles in your catalogue are unique. And you do that by adding key attributes like size, gender, colour, material and pattern. And this is really important for a number of reasons. Firstly, Google allows 150 characters in your titles. Now as a lot of you know, or I'm sure all of you know, in a number of the different PLA ad formats, uh, the title gets cut off well before that point. Um, but Google actually indexes all 150 characters for search relevance. So uh, having those attributes in there can be a great way to lift your impressions. Uh, the second reason why this is really important is that when you do have a PLA ad format like these examples here, uh, where you do see the whole title, uh, you can imagine if you're shopping for a Burberry trench coat and you see this first one here, uh, it includes the material, it says cotton, uh, it's got the gender, it's got the colour and it's got the size. So someone seeing that PLA is going to be quite informed uh, and when they make a click it's going to be a more qualified click and as a result they're going to be more likely to convert. As opposed to somebody who sees this second one which just says Burberry trench coat, they're likely to potentially click on that, go through and find out that their size isn't available or a number of things because it's not in the title. So uh, obviously um, the first one is, is uh, an example of what to do in that case. Uh, and the last reason why you want to make your titles unique uh, is just because if you've got a whole lot of product variants in your feed, so different colours, different sizes of the same item, and they all have the same title, like Burberry trench coat, for example, they're all just going to compete with each other in the auction, which you obviously don't want. So generally the title structure you want to follow is brand plus product type plus attributes, but the order of these things will change depending on the situation. I've already said that you don't always want to put brand to the front. And there's a few other situations where you might change the order, which leads me on to my next point. It's really important to view your PLAs and your ads from the consumer's perspective. If there's something in the image, uh, sorry, if there's a, a, an important piece of information that isn't obvious from the image, uh, you should move that bit of information to the front or near the front of your title. The reason I say this is that most traffic originates from the search results page. The vast amount of impressions from PLAs, uh, sorry, clicks from PLAs come from the search results page. Uh, and as you know, and as you can see, on the search results page, generally you get three, maybe four words in your title before it gets cut off. Uh, so in this example here, with running shoes, it's often really difficult to tell where the gender of the shoe, so whether it's a, a man's shoe or a woman's shoe. Uh, so in this case, moving gender to the front is going to ensure that for these specific offers, uh, the person seeing the ad is going to be far more informed, the clicks are going to be more qualified, and they're going to be more likely to convert. Now this isn't going to work for everything in your feed, it's not even going to work for all shoes. You can imagine a high heel shoe, there's probably not much point putting the, the word women's at the front of the title. Um, but it will work in some instances. Some other examples here are for size types like plus size and maternity. Again, it might not be obvious from the image, so it's valuable putting those things to the front of your title. Okay, moving on to descriptions and a few tips here. So I said that you can have 150 characters in your titles. You can actually have up to 5,000 characters in your descriptions. So the best descriptions will actually include all of that really important information that I told you to include in your title. It'll have that in there, but it'll have everything else that's relevant to the product that you're advertising. So the best descriptions will take all of that relevant information from your landing page, uh, you know, things like key selling points, attribute names and values, or anything that you've got that people might actually search for. And you can imagine some quite technical products would have a lot of tech specs and that kind of thing. It's really valuable to include all that information in your feed because you never know how specific someone's search query is going to be. So the best way to think about it is if it's relevant, if someone might search for it, put it in your description, use up to 5,000 characters. The one thing I will say about this is avoid just keyword stuffing for the sake of it. So the keyword is relevant. So you don't want to just stuff a whole lot of irrelevant content in there just to get up to 5,000 characters. So you know, shorter keyword rich descriptions are going to be more valuable and deliver better performance than longer descriptions stuffed with irrelevant content. Okay, so I'm going to talk quickly about unique product identifiers uh, and specifically GTINs. So GTINs stand for Global Trade Item Number and it's effectively the barcode uh, of the products in your catalogue. Uh, you may know them as EANs or UPCs. Those are both just types of GTIN. So to Google, that's, that's one and the same. These are becoming really important and more important to Google Shopping and performance on Google Shopping. And the reason for that is that Google uses GTINs to group offers together. So you can imagine a scenario where a number of merchants are selling exactly the same product. You go to a Google Shopping results page, you might have 36 offers displayed in a grid, and they could be all the same, just from different merchants at different prices. If they all had the correct GTIN 
in their feed. Google would group them all together. Uh, and then the shopper could actually click on the PLA and then scroll through and compare all of the different offers, the prices, the merchants. And then the click that they do finally make, the paid click, is going to be once again far more qualified and more likely to convert. So it's really important. And Google is ensuring with its policies that this becomes more, more of a focus as well. So my recommendations are here are make GTINs a requirement from all of your suppliers. Um, pay specific attention to the set of designated brands which Google outlined last week in its update to the, to the feed spec. If you haven't seen that, it's a list of 50 global brands that are going to require GTIN by the 15th of September as a mandatory attribute. Otherwise, they'll potentially start getting disapproved. So go online to the Google Merchant Center help, um, have a look at that list and make that list your priority in terms of finding GTINs. Um, outside of those 50 brands, generally the rule, and it differs depending on the type of product, but generally you require at least two out of the three key unique identifiers. Those three things are GTIN, brand, which I'm sure all of you have, and manufacturer part number, or MPN. So in the interim, as a, as a short-term solution, uh, if you are chasing your, your GTINs, if you don't have them in your feed, if you do have brand and MPN, include them in your feed, and that'll ensure that your products stay live in the PLA auction um, while you're chasing those GTINs. Price and availability uh, and having those accurate in your feed is one of the biggest drivers of performance with Google Shopping and PLAs. And there's two reasons for that. The first one is that Google is super strict on price and availability. I can't stress this enough. Uh, if Google's crawlers find a discrepancy between what's in your feed and subsequently in your PLAs and what's on your landing page, those items will get disapproved straight away. And if this is happening consistently, uh, your account's going to get suspended. It happens all of the time. The second reason why this is really important is the obvious one. It's a, a user experience issue. If you are looking for a product, you see a PLA, and you, you decide you'd like to buy it and you click on it, only to find that on the landing page it's either out of stock or actually more expensive than you're expecting. Uh, that's obviously not going to be a good user experience. Um, it's going to be a wasted click and you're probably going to lose a bit of consumer trust in the process. So my recommendations here are update your price and availability as often as possibly you can. Uh, there's a few ways you can do this. The most technologically advanced way is to integrate with Google's content API for shopping. Um, in a lot of cases, you can avoid this issue without going that far. Uh, and you can do that by providing um, regular updates to your feed. And it, it's not often feasible to send your feed multiple times throughout the day. Um, and you don't actually need to send the whole feed because things like images, titles, descriptions aren't going to change on a daily basis. What you can now do is send what's called a product inventory update feed, which is just price and availability. Uh, so if you do that, it's a smaller feed, it's faster to process, uh, and if you can send those three, four, five times a day, you're going to avoid uh, almost all of those discrepancies. Uh, the second thing I'll mention is turn on automatic item updates. Uh, for those of, the, of you that don't know what this is, uh, it's relatively new to Google. It was introduced late last year. Um, but effectively, if you activate this, what it means is that when Google's crawler uh, finds a discrepancy between uh, what's in your feed and what's on your landing page, it will automatically update that to the correct information on the landing page rather than disapproving the product. So it's a great safety net for price and availability. Uh, it does require a little bit of work on your side. You need to have the uh, schema.org tag implemented. Um, so it may require a little bit of IT work, um, but I definitely recommend this. Image quality is something that's factored into your quality score, so it's really important. But it's also even increasingly important uh, with mobile where often the titles are heavily cut down or truncated um, or not visible at all. Um, so a few tips in terms of your images. Make sure you have high res, clear images displayed on a white or light colored background. Uh, Google recommends 800 by 800 pixel resolution. If you can get to that level or above, then perfect. Make sure that the image uh, is an exact match with the product that you're advertising, including the color, which is also really important. A few things to avoid. Uh, multiple products in the same image uh, and, and having a cluttered background uh, are obviously going to affect performance, particularly in search results page where the images are really small. It's going to be hard for people to know what you're advertising. So those two things will be detrimental to uh, performance. Uh, the next two points uh, are actually going to be policy um, uh, against Google policy and they'll get your products disapproved and that's having placeholder images like this one here uh, or having text, logos, watermarks or promotions. So pay attention to that. Try and get your images all high res and nice and clear. Quick note on landing pages and your landing page URLs. Um, and this is something that not a lot of retailers do. But as, as a lot of you know, the less clicks it takes somebody to get from that first click to a conversion, the more likely they are to convert. And a great way to ensure that you reduce the number of clicks 
is to have your landing page URLs in your feed lead to a landing page with the color and the size already pre-selected. Uh, and it seems obvious, it'll, it'll reduce the number of clicks, um, but it'll actually also, maybe not in this case, but in some cases, um, you'll avoid people actually purchasing the wrong product. And you might think that that seems unlikely, but if you can imagine a product like uh, an iPhone, for example, uh, where from the picture, it could be really difficult to tell whether it's silver or gray. And if you click on a PLA for a gray iPhone, let's say, and you go to the landing page and their automatic pre-selected color is silver, you're probably going to purchase it thinking it's the one that you saw in the PLA. And then you're going to have people returning products to you, which will cost you money. They may not repurchase, and you're probably going to lose a bit of trust as well. Um, so that's a really important point. Just a few more to go. Uh, this one's one on categorization. So the product type attribute in your feed is one of two uh, attributes uh, that refer to categorization. This one's really important. One, it helps Google categorize your products. But two, it's one of the attributes that gets pulled through into AdWords. So it allows you to, to structure your uh, shopping campaigns um, a lot better and a lot smarter. Um, the Google product category is the other attribute in the feed, and that's set. You have to categorize your products exactly to what Google says is its categorization taxonomy. With the product type, you can categorize your products however you like, and, and whichever way makes sense for you guys. So a lot of retailers will use the, the hierarchy categorization on their website. Um, but you can do it however you like, that's the point. Um, my recommendations here would be to make sure that your product type categorization is hierarchical, type-based, and detailed, and have a think about how you'd like to structure your shopping campaigns, and make sure that the way you set up your product type flows nicely into that. It'll not only help with your shopping campaign structure, it'll help with reporting and analysis, but it will also free up custom labels to use for other more performance-based uh, metrics, which leads me on to my last point, which is about custom labels. So let's imagine you've done all of the things I just said. So you've got great titles and descriptions, your price and availability is updated uh, regularly, your images are great, all of those things. Um, now what you want to do is use custom labels in your feed to really refine your bidding strategy. So let's imagine you sell thousands of SKUs, including dresses, uh, and in this case, black dresses. In this specific example, most likely these three dresses are all part of the same campaign, so they're getting the same bid. So you can see here they've all got a cost per click bid of one pound or one euro. Um, but as you know, your individual SKUs are going to have different performance. Uh, so you can see here, the first one performs quite well. Conversion rate of 4.8%, average order value of 179 pounds, uh, which flows on to a pretty good return on ad spend. The second one doesn't perform quite as well, and the third one obviously is quite a poor performer. So it doesn't make sense for you to bid the same on each of these three items, but with thousands of products, maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of SKUs in your catalogue, it also doesn't make sense for you to go in and manually change each of your bids based on performance. So this is where custom labels come in. So for a very simple example, if you used one of your custom labels for performance uh, and grouped your SKUs together in, let's say, in this case, top performers, average performers, and poor performers, uh, you can adjust your bid on that basis, which, as you can see, uh, gives ROAS a nice little lift uh, across the board. So that's it from me. I know that was a lot of information in a fairly short space of time. Uh, as I said, I'm going to be outside the auditorium afterwards. If anyone's got any questions for me or you just want to know more about channel intelligence and what we do, come and find me. Happy to have a chat. And with that, I'll pass over to Bastian. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Bastien. I work here as Google as a shopping specialist. And I'm going to guide you through what can you do with your shopping campaign and uh, a little tips and tricks when you're thinking about how to optimize my PLAs. So but let me just uh, first of all talk about uh, retail specificity, which is how to calculate profit. Profit is the uh, objective number one for all the retailers. So when you think about profit, it's pretty much the revenue less the expenses that you got. So for typical online retailers, what can be those expenses? Those expenses can be the wholesale prices, the price that you acquire your products. That can be the warehouse prices, the shipping costs, the customer acquisition costs, etc. And from my perspective, every time I talk to retailers, all the time they tell to me about how to optimize sales, why it's important to maximize profit. So they have two main ways of doing that, right? It can be either increasing revenue, such as increasing prices, but this can be very dangerous in today's very competitive landscape. They have another option, which is decreasing expenses. 
So when you think about marketing costs, that could lead to how to optimize my return on ad spend, my return on investment. So thinking only about margin, this is pretty much half of the profit equation. When you really think about profit, you really have to think about inventory turnover. This option is really important because uh, it is pretty much how much, you, how much you sell times how much you make on a sale. So the inventory turnover is uh, basically uh, how often a retailer's inventory is being sold and replaced over a period of time. So this uh, margin times inventory turnover is really what makes your profit at the end of each sale. I'm pretty sure you're already familiar with those kind of graphs. So there is a real retail uh, specificity because retail depends heavily on selling the highest number of low margin products in order to maximize their profit. This is very different from what we can observe from the business services, for example, or even the pharmaceutical one. So the retail is pretty much like the grocery stores in terms of uh, low margin products that are being sold. But let's back to the discussion of PLA. And when you really think about how to optimize your PLA, when you are in front of a, a campaign, this is pretty much how to find the right balance between how I can maximize my return on ad spend, increase my ROAS, and why it's important to uncap the sales volume for my top performing products. So we're gonna go through all these six bullet points, but a uh, few things to have in mind uh, when you're talking about increasing your ROAS. It's pretty much about how I can do to find my top performing products. So what I would advise is to break them out, refine beads based on their performances, and look at the benchmark signals that help you take the good decision. Why it's important to cap unsales volume is because you have to give more budget to the top performing products that you got across your inventory. So you're running a retail business which is highly seasonal and it's important to understand how you can get the most out of shopping campaign by uh, running those uh, temporary rates. And last but not least, pay attention to your competition. We're gonna go through that in a minute. So best practices for increasing my ROAS with Google Shopping. So a few things uh, to keep in mind. So my first piece of advice here will be try to, look, try to have a look at where you're losing some traffic due to uncompetitive bids. And try to see if you are way below the benchmark. So try to look at the max CPC against the benchmark max CPC. If those product groups are profitable to you, you should maybe think about rising your bids and see how you're performing in, in terms of getting more traffic. <coughs> the other one, so those are quite new uh, columns. They are bid simulator columns. And what it will uh, tell you, it's actually the incremental amount of clicks that you can get by rising your bids. So this is just new columns that you can add to your reporting view. And then what you can uh, understand with that, so you have many options, either, either uh, rising your bids by 50% up to 300%, and it will give you the number of clicks that you might get by doing that. So little tips here, if you already know the average of visitor that you need in order to make a sales on your website, then those metrics can be really powerful. Again, uh, I will suggest to look at both value at the same time, so where you lose some traffic due to uncompetitive bids against the ROAS, the conversion value per cost. So when both metrics are low, what you can do is actually uh, try to increase your conversion rate in order to increase your profitability, right? So for example, for this very much uh, product group, which is Cruiser, both metrics are quite low, so what you can do is go to the dimension tab and see the number of item IDs that are among this, this uh, cruiser product group. And if they're not that profitable, then you might restructure, you might refine your, your product group structure. I just talked about uh, reporting. This is very crucial when you are uh, doing some PLAs. So you have a tab which is called dimension tab. You can select the shopping view and then every attributes that you've been using to structure your shopping campaign. So what, what you can do here is, so the most common one are the, the product type and the brand. I'm pretty sure you're, also, you're already familiar with it. So what we can see here is, for example, for the women's apparel product type, uh, there are three main brands that are performing a little bit better than the others. So you can see that by looking at the conversion metrics, if you got the conversion tracking in, in place. So obviously the number of conversion the ROAS, or even the conversion rate. 
If you don't have the conversion tracking in place, then you should, but that's not my point. You should have a look to the click and impression, which is also giving you some, uh, some insight to take the good decision. Uh, the everything else uh, target, we, we usually call that the cut shoulder as well. And uh, what you can do about it to optimize it because uh, it's running a lot of, uh, it's driving a lot of traffic to your website because there's a lot of products uh, commonly in this, uh, in these products. So what you can do is try to understand what are the low margin products in the catch all and then go back to your feeds and try to put a custom label with a low margin and then subdivide it uh, by putting a lower bid on it. So you make sure you're not spending too much money on those products that are not your top performing one. Uh, there is a specificity with the shopping campaign. You can, you can actually have a look to how the benchmark is doing versus your own PLAs. So I would suggest to look at the benchmark CTR versus your own CTR and try to understand uh, what's the user behavior when they see, when, uh, how they react when they see one of your PLA ads. So many, many insight that you can get out of it, it's pretty much how you're positioning yourself in terms of price competitiveness, for example. What could be the quality of your feed? So Ben already talked about that uh, earlier, but pretty much if you have good image quality, good uh, titles, redaction, etc. So those are very powerful metrics. And you got the same one for the benchmark mark CPC as well. Uh, just wanted to give you a quick heads up. This is a new uh, report available in Google Analytics. And what I can do about it, it's segment your PLA traffic and see where users are dropping off in your website. So it's really good to see, to, to do that analysis per cross category, for example, and maybe take long-term uh, adjustment on your website, doing some UX experiment and so on. So I would uh, suggest you to go and talk to your account manager that already know those kind of reports. So it's available in GA. Next uh, topic, so why it's important to uncap volume for your top performing products. So again, uh, dimension tab, you can find a lot of insight there. So try to look at every attribute, every products that you have uh, within your, your inventory and try to understand what are the top products that are driving sales for you. A, good, a, be a best practice here it will be uh, create another additional campaign that can be called the best, the best seller campaign, for example, and then you can segment out those specific products, either by using custom label if there are too many products, or you can use the item ID level if this is not too manual for you. Then just so create another campaign for the best seller, uh, put a higher priority, higher bids on it, and then uh, this campaign will take the lead on the other one. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Google Trends uh, speaking about Google Trends, there's a, a new update on it. You can see real-time data. So it's pretty, pretty useful when you are running sales and you want to do uh, how your kind of products that you have among your, your inventory are performing on a daily basis. But speaking about that, uh, because you're all running a retail business uh, that are highly uh, dependable on the high period of, of uh, popularity, so what you can do if, if you have two similar products or even products accessory on your, on your inventory, you can try to look at uh, and understand the trending products that are, that are performing well, uh, how they are performing versus user's behavior, and then uh, take the good decision out of it. <coughs> Last but not least, uh, the auction inside tab. So, it will give you a lot of uh, information about the impression share that you get on PLA, the impression share of your top competitor as well. It will give you how much you overlap your PLA ads with your, with your competitors and the outworking share. I'm gonna talk about that metrics in a second because we, recent, we recently launched the device and time segmentation in the auction insight. So for example, if you're running some mobile PLA, um, on your, on your campaign, what you can do is maybe run this report for about a month and see how your mobile PLA are performing versus the benchmark. So the uh, outranking share, for example, is the number of time your ad is uh, ranked higher than the, than the benchmark, than the competitors. So maybe uh, you can go back to your mobile byte modifier and make some adjustments 
if you really want to increase your, your performances on the, on the top uh, product that you got on mobile PLA. So let's talk briefly, let's sum up what I've been talking about. Uh, so again, remember the increasing ROAS versus the uncapping sales, the, the, the balance uh, I, show you to you, I showed to you earlier. So a few takeaways here, uh, try to play with your bid, try to look at how the benchmark is performing, try to look at bid simulator columns, those are very powerful metrics. Uh, the reporting as well, try to do that uh, on, the, on the, the attributes that you are using to structure your, your campaign. Um, this is also important to check the data quality and, and the benchmark CTR to see the, to understand a little bit better the consumer behavior when they see how they, how they react when they see one of your products. And the other uh, bucket is try to uh, uncap the sales volume for your top performing products using Google Trends and uh, the Auction Insights in order to know better how your mobile PLA are performing. Thanks a lot for your attention. Afternoon, everybody. Um, we're nearing the end, so you know, let's uh, well, we'll try and keep it keep it interesting, keep it brief. My name is Brian McCaffrey. I work on the uh, as a, an audience sales lead here at Google for the UK team. I've worked with probably some people in the room here and uh, lots of other advertisers throughout the UK. I work mainly on audience products, so a lot of remarketing and a lot of um, uh, other in market similar audiences, things like that. The question I'm here to answer is. How can I use audience data to improve, uh, improve performance? So <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about here, uh, I'm, I suppose really the, the first thing is a lot of what, we're, what we do here, um, we should really make use of the work that's already been done. So it was uh, someone asked for a show of hands earlier on the number of people using shopping, vast majority of the room, logically enough, being a retail event. Um, also a show of hands on who, how many people are using RLSA, and a good number of the room are doing that. So if you have those two, uh, those two elements already active, then uh, using audience data across display becomes a very, very logical choice. So you heard about yesterday uh, with dynamic remarketing being a core product, and for what I'm talking about, this really does become the core product. There's lots you can do with it, but really, as a standard setup, it does the job, it does an awful lot for you. As a quick run through as to what I'm talking about with Dynamic, um, when I go onto the House of Fraser website, as I often do, and I look at a Michael Kors tote handbag, which again, I often do, um, I look at it and I decide not to buy it for some reason. Now, again, the reasons why people don't buy something immediately mightn't be the right place, they mightn't get paid until next week, the kids knocked over the computer and they, they can't buy it right now. There's a million reasons. But it also means that there's a million reasons to contact them again, get back in touch and make sure that they remember why they should actually buy this product, why they were interested and why they should uh, remember that they trust your brand. So the idea is when I do this, I don't buy it and then next time when I'm reading The Guardian, um, I then see this ad. Now the importance in this ad is, it first of all shows the brand I was looking at, it shows the handbag that I, I was looking at, a similar handbag and other products that I may be interested in. Probably should have got a, a better example for that one, but you know, I might be buying presents for somebody. Anyway, um, what I was gonna say about this is the, the checklist to make this uh, correct is to put the remarketing tag across your site with a couple of custom parameters, small bit more information that we need to make sure we're showing the right product to people. Uh, connect it to your Google Merchant Center and then use the Creative Builder in AdWords, which is a fantastic way to customize and make your dynamic ads right on brand and make sure that people understand uh, what it is you're selling and they click through right through to, uh, to the product that they know they like. Now, for the most part, the way people are using this and the right way to, to use this is very much in a funnel strategy, so with homepage visitors, it's going to be a low bid. We're just, we know they're kind of warm, but they're, we, they don't know too much about us just yet. After that, it's when people look at a product and don't buy it, or put it in the basket and don't buy it. 
that's the sort of thing. And then if you're, if you're getting really into it, you can talk to past purchasers and try and get them to refer people or whatever it is. But in all honesty, most people are in around this area. This is where, uh, if you think of the funnel of see, think, do, and then care, really we're in the do area here. We want people who are in, in the shopping mode, they're, um, they're looking to buy, they haven't quite, and we want them to just to make sure. And this is exactly how you should set up your sort of main remarketing strategy, and uh, that's sort of where you're going to have a good CPA and <clears throat> make use of it. But there are other ways you can, you can uh, other things you can pass into AdWords to make sure that you're uh, informing these decisions correctly and also moving up the funnel into the sort of think area and un making people understand what you're delivering, what, what you can actually provide for them. So just before we get into that, I'm going to do a little bit on, on, the, on the tag itself, our uh, standard remarketing tag that you get in AdWords. So if you look here, this is the Google Play Store um, for devices. And this uh, tool here on the right is an extension. It's in your toolkit. It's called the Google Tag Assistant. It shows you how your Google tags are uh, implemented, if they're done correctly, and any errors and, and suggestions that should be there. So this one, this is just a straightforward tag. And to zoom in on what it looks like, very, very straightforward. It just gives you the, uh, the ID that of your, um, your account, for you specifically. And, <clears throat> um, and all it passes to us is the URL that the person has hit and a timestamp. So if your remarketing strategy can be covered by that, perfectly fine. If you want to go and do dynamic remarketing, as I mentioned, again, we're on a product page here. And all we need to pass to zoom in again, a product ID, that's the one that matches your merchant center. And the page type tells us is a product, or is a cart page, or what is it? So this allows us to segment the campaign sensibly to say these people looked at a product and didn't uh, buy it. They put it in a basket, and we really should uh, uh, target these users. <clears throat> but if you go into AdWords um, and you look at, uh, sorry, if you go into the Help Center and you look at uh, what you should do for Dynamic, these are the suggestions you'll get, and these are the parameters you should pass. But the truth is that there's absolutely no limit to the number of parameters you can pass. So as long as it's not personally identifiable information, there's no reason that, uh, that you shouldn't pass more of this information if it can inform your strategy and help you segment users the, the correct way. So I put forward a couple of suggestions here as to what you could actually pass. And this is where you guys need to think a little more about what information you have. What do you have when someone comes to the site or gets to a certain phase um, and what could actually inform your next your, uh, advertising decision. So uh, the first couple here is sensible. They're the page type and cart that I already discussed. Next ones is the category. It's very, very sensible. If you look at the page you're actually on here, I'm looking at a Chromecast. This is the Google Play Store, so it's, it's listed as uh, other devices. So if I, if I buy a Chromecast, fine. I know what the site is. I know how, how it delivers. But really, I'm buying the low value item that's on the site. There's lots and lots of uh, other devices, such as you know, the phones and tablets and various uh, wearables that are actually out there. And if I was running this campaign, I'd be saying, right, he's bought a Chromecast. Let's see if we can upsell him with something else. We know he's bought one type of product. I wonder would he be interested in something else. You guys will know the things that relate to the various products. So this is where you need to start thinking through this strategy. Total value, logical enough. If, uh, you sh if someone has put something in the value of in the basket, more than 200, more than 300, depending on the ticket value of your, uh, of your site, then you really need to go after those guys. Or you know what? If someone has put something worth a tenner and you know it's not really worth it, don't target them. Let's leave them alone. They'll probably come back, or it's just uh, they may have got it somewhere else. Looking a bit further, indicator products. Again, it all depends on the information you have about your site. I know some, some uh, retailers in the room will know that if someone buys a certain thing on their site, it indicates that they're very much into something. Like sports retailers will know um, that if someone buys a certain part for a bike, they're probably a triathlete. It's worth putting them in the triathlete section and then maybe hitting them with a wetsuit or whatever it is, and then they become a high value uh, customer straight from there. Look in the next sort of section, I've put it, uh, this is just a little bit more about the device. So, you know, so obviously we've heard loads about mobile all, uh, for the last couple of days. So if someone has come in via mobile, this is a, a different message that you need to give. You, you may need to change your timing. You may, may need to uh, highlight that you can buy via a uh, mobile phone, whatever it is. 
the regions can be brilliant for pure players, so, or sorry, for multi-channel. If you have an event on in store, you can target the people who have come specifically uh, to your site from a certain area. So if you, can, if you have that information, if they pass that information, then you can put it on, onto the tag and target people later on. The channel is obvious enough as well, so if people have come via display remarketing or via search, you can then alter, uh, alter your campaigns and segment to the, to the right message. Looking down at the bottom here, and this is, again, this is getting very much deeper into what you know about the user on your site and what you want to do about that. So the first one is logged in users. If I go onto any of your sites now, I'm sure if I'm a, a current member, it'll log me straight in. So that information is there. If you can pass that into AdWords, very, very strong signal as to what we should do about this. person is not logged in. Very, very strong message because we should push them to make sure they log in or make sure they register. This is a very important message to bring them through and then uh, improve customer lifetime value based on that. Number of shops, uh, again, this, this has a lot to do with customer lifetime uh, value. And <clears throat> with this, you, it again depends on what's important for your business. I know some of the online grocers that I've worked with um, in other parts of Europe have, have a magic number of if they get someone to buy and get the delivery five times, it's absolutely key. If they hit it five times, the person becomes hooked and they're actually going to stick with them and be brand loyal from there. So they work very, very hard to pass this information. And if it is at three here, they'll bid very hard to make sure they push them to the fourth and push them to the fifth. And then their CRM in, um, system will, will uh, be sure that the person sticks on. They can keep an eye on when they last shopped. You could pass a date for last shop. And then if someone hasn't shopped in a month, you could consider them lapsed and, uh, and then really target them again rather than people who shopped yesterday. There's no need to panic about those guys. They'll probably be back. And lastly, if you have customer segments already and you know that people are, are loyal customers or they're high value when they do visit, but uh, low frequency, whatever it is, you may have this already. If you can pass that uh, into your tag, and you can pass it as group one, two, three, four, or five, it doesn't really matter. But as long as you know what they mean, then you can uh, set up your, your campaigns to hit them with a sale message, try and re-engage people earlier than they normally do, whatever it is that you want to do. But there is a lot of information that you know about your customers, or your CRM teams, or your BI teams will know about your customers, about how they shop. And if you can use that to start to inform your advertising, that's when you're starting to really use data and, and audience to, um, to make sensible advertising decisions. As I said earlier, the, the way that <coughs> most people and uh, most providers in this area will stick very much down in that do area, and it'll be very much basket abandoners and really, really hammer those guys. Now, we don't believe in hammering those guys. Our systems are designed to, uh, to have a natural frequency cap if people aren't interested we don't really want to show the message to them. So the quality score will drift off and, and uh, a better ad will show because that's what we want. We want the, the clicks to go. What we do actually want is use this information sensibly. So use this information to bring out of that do area and into the think or even into the see in the first place to introduce what we think are, are uh, good potential prospects. Introduce them to your brand and allow them to understand that you are actually a big player in this market or you can offer something different. To where they are already shopping. So in traditional media, the brand and, and performance or the prospecting and performance can be very, very different. Here is where I'm talking about using this sensibly to, to go up. Now, one of the ways we can do it is using uh, similar audiences. Now, I'm not going to make this into a pure product pitch, I promise, but it's just a one tool that we have or one targeting type that we have that can really make sure that uh, you are using the correct audience information. To run through similar audiences very, very quickly, you have a remarketing list and our system looks at the users on that list and it, it uh, tries to find some similarities in uh, hundreds of signals. When they shop, their gender, their um, browsing behavior, various things. And once it does and it finds a sort of uh, a, a, a typical user within that list, then it goes around the net and finds maybe four or five times the size of that list of people who behave in the same way but have never been to your site. So they're into the same things, they have the similar shopping habits, etc., but they just don't know your site. So it's pure new customer acquisition. That was my big graphic for that. It's nice, isn't it? Cost a fortune. Um, so 
But really, what I would say with similar audiences, I mean, it's been out uh, about two years now. And what, we've, what the sort of logical first step was for best practice was anyone who's converted on my site, I want to find a similar audience to those guys. And it does make sense, but really at this stage, we need to get a little bit deeper than that. And so you guys will know that the, the product offering on most of your sites is, is very, very vast and very, very different from the most expensive to the, to the uh, cheapest item or very different in what it actually does through to, through to the other end of the spectrum to being an extremely detailed product. So what, what you should be doing is using the parameters that we spoke about earlier, like the categories that people have shopped on, um, the, uh, the value of things that they're, they're putting in their basket, using those to divine, define your, your seed list and then make a similar audience off that. And as a quick example, again, back to a sports retailer, if, uh, if I buy something or if I put something in the basket at the, um, in the swimwear area, I'm, there's no point showing me a 2,000 uh, pound bike if, uh, if I'm just interested in a 15 pound pair of goggles. That's not sensible use. And I'm, I'm going to be like, some weird cycling company is trying to target me now. That, that doesn't make any sense. However, if you make a list of people who have um, put uh, running gear or a pair of running shoes into the basket, then you actually uh, you can make a, uh, use that as your seed list and make that into, uh, make that into the, uh, the, re the similar audience list that you really need to uh, deliver against. Now, what I'm going to say about similar audiences and, and anything outside of the remarketing zone, once you start moving up this, the funnel like that, is really how do, you, uh, how do you value that and how do you make sense of how much you should pay to get this person on site? Um, you should start thinking, you know, similar audiences as a product for us, it, yes, it has a, a significant CPA element to it. It actually does perform well. Not quite as good as remarketing, logically, because people haven't been to your site before. But it is actually very strong. So, but really, you should be thinking, how much is it, is it worth to bring a qualified lead to my site? Um, what's the CPC that this is going to be worth? And what sort of assisted click nature is this going to provide for us? Uh, I'm going to hand over to Roshi now, who's going to discuss this a little further. Thank you very much, Brian, Bastian, and everyone else. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Roisin. I'm from that team with the funny name Performance X. I stand between you and lunch, so I'm just going to kick off straight away uh, and move quickly uh, through it. Um, so the question that I'm really here to answer is, how can I account for the user journey um, across media that I buy, across the, the way they reach my site? How can I get smarter about buying? Um, but what I thought I'd start with first is, is a kind of quick update. Um, some of you might know that you can actually turn Google Analytics into your remarketing platform. Um, this previously required update to tagging in code, but if anything that you've heard from Brian today makes you feel like I can't implement another tag on my site, you can start to use these same strategies if you're already using Google Analytics. Um, one other great update that we've made is that rather than having to recode your site or add any, any extra lines, you can actually just enable this within the AdWords or within the Google Analytics interface. If you go to data collection and toggle remarketing to on, uh, update your privacy policy, of course, um, you'll be able to just enable that straight away and go uh, from the next day. The other thing that the eagle eye among you might have spotted is that we've actually also introduced the ability to remarket to search from Google Analytics. So any list that you can create in Google Analytics, you can now start to target people on search. Um, helpfully, not just Google, but many other people have contributed to the Google Analytics Solutions Gallery with remarketing lists. So you'll see a link to this in your workbook, and you'll be able uh, to go and, and search, and you'll be able to search for remarketing. Um, find lists that you can get started with and you can import to your analytics and AdWords accounts within two clicks. They'll include things like added to cart, they'll include things like spent 10 minutes on site, um, browse 10 different products, lots of great lists that you can use to get started from tomorrow. So um, the other great thing that you can do within Google Analytics is create segments and virtually any segment that you can use, you can then target. Now there's a few differences between what can happen on search and display. Here we have demographics, technology, and behavior. Those can be used to target on display. Uh, they can't be used on search. 
but virtually any segment that you can create, you can then find a way to target that demand. So I took an example here of organic, and let's just say we've made some changes to our website based on some poor bounce rates that we've seen before, and we know that actually the conversion rates are going to increase. Well, let's retarget the users who went to those pages from Google Organic uh, and get them back into site, get them experiencing our updated website. Um, we also have an option to say how many sessions and did someone use and did they transact. So have someone conducted three sessions in the last day and still hasn't bought, but really looks like this is the kind of user that we really want to target. We really want to get back. They're showing a much higher propensity to shop with us directly. Uh, you heard Bastian mention enhanced e-commerce. Now, that does require some tagging updates, but if you can uh, implement enhanced e-commerce, you can create remarketing lists in seconds. So, for example, put in your category name, and instantly you can pop up uh, suggestions for the different brands that you might want to, to remarket to across the board, see the audience lists and size, and then target those people. Um, you can add also on a stage of whether they added to cart or just reviewed product information, anything else based on their website behavior. And finally, the one that I love most, you can create cohorts. So you can actually say, I just want to create a list or a segment of people that I want to, to measure that visited my site between these days. Um, maybe I launched a new TV campaign, maybe I launched some outdoor and we're actually seeing a spike in traffic to the site. We want to be able to target those people with some similar messages across digital. All of that is possible to any user of Google Analytics, standard or premium. So one example of where this has been really powerful for a retailer, Watchfinder sell Rolexes in the UK, and they were one of the first to use uh, Google Analytics remarketing for display. They had recently opened their first physical store, so this was a little bit last year, and they really needed to, to draw awareness to really find a smart way of targeting people. Um, they created a set of 20 different lists. The lists included things like uh, geographic location and ISP. And they were able then to determine this is a list of users that look like they're in the financial district in London, would they like a Rolex? Quite smart targeting. Um, they also were able to create a list where people had visited from France but landed on their English website, which they'd only recently launched a French website. So they were able to retarget those users to say, here's our French website, you can have the experience that you really want. What I thought most informative about this case study is their best performing list by far was first time site visitors who browsed for 10 minutes. And to Brown's point about how to really smart, you know, smartly retarget people, being able to add engagement and page depth into the way that you create your marketing lists is a hugely powerful option. So I recommend everyone take a, a quick look. Um, if any of that seems like too much work, we've also introduced something called Smart Lists, which uses machine learning to create a similar audience to your website converters based on their behavior on your site. So not anything that you can get just from what they're searching for or anything else, but just what have they done on our site. And you can share that automatically to display and to search. So coming then to the customer journey, um, it's great to think about segmentation, but how can you really start to interrogate the information that you might have in analytics already to make sense of what you should be doing in terms of allocating your marketing budget? Um, if you go to Think with Google and search for a customer journey, you'll be able to get to this benchmark report that we've created from analytics users who are sharing data with Google and who use e-commerce. And you'll be able to see that what types of channels more often are completing existing user journeys and what types of channels more often assist in those journeys but introduce users to site. You'll be able to see that we can split out uh, generic paid search from brand paid search and that generic paid search pays more of a, plays more of an upper funnel value. All very useful, all very interesting, and you can see it for different categories, shopping, home and garden, um, many others. But what if you wanted to do this yourself for your own information? So one thing that we know from having worked very closely with Bastian and the team is that Google Shopping is great. You've told us this yesterday, you thought it was, it was fantastic, it really delivers great results. But an emerging trend that we're seeing is that as we all clean up our, our data feed issues, as Google helps release all of these great tools, CPCs start to rise a little bit. And it's a little bit more difficult to say, where should I put my spend? Should it be on brand paid search with Google? Should it be in shopping campaigns? Should it be just in generic search where uh, shopping images don't show? All of this is, is a tool that we're trying to create to bring to your, um, your account manager so that we can start to give you an idea of how these things perform together and where you might find the best CPA across the board. Uh, of course, some of you have also told us that shopping isn't available in your country and you're quite disappointed. So what else could you do in Google Analytics? 
Um, well, to do this, I picked the, the Google merchandise store and tried to see if I could come up with some good insights from that store. I learned some really interesting things. One, we're terrible at marketing. Uh, and two, we don't always take our best advice. But I'll be able to go through that and, and give you an idea of what you can do uh, across the board to understand your audience. But generally, uh, first off, the biggest question anyone asks about attribution is what model should I pick? And a little bit uh, back to our kind of earlier conversation, certain channels are more last click, and they tend to complete existing paths. So if you have a kind of a website that has a, a very high uh, brand awareness in a particular area, you're the leader in your category in your country, last click may be the right model for you. Um, if you're going towards a more aggressive strategy, you're introducing something new, you're going to a new uh, export market, anything else, you may want to consider uh, different, ma different um, models across this line. Um, but within Google Analytics, you also have um, options to use much more customized and rule-based lists. Um, so Google Analytics, someone actually said to us a tweet last night to say, why aren't people talking about Analytics Premium? We really want to know more, and it's a solution to so many problems. We're not here to sell you Analytics Premium, but I'll touch on what kind of things that you can get from there. One of the primary ones is unsampled reports, which some of you have told me you're really, really keen on doing. If you want to know more about Premium, contact your account manager. We're happy to sit down and talk to you about whether it's the right solution for you. Um, but for anyone within Google Analytics standard, you're able to create custom rules. Custom rules allow you to do things like, say, I only want to credit a display impression when someone came to my site 10 minutes after seeing it and stayed for 10 minutes. Um, it's this kind of ability that really can tell you how display is interacting with some of your other channels. It's, of course, also available in DoubleClick. Um, Data-driven attribution. Data-driven attribution takes a look at your converted paths, so what, uh, what steps people took before converting, and then it automatically comp compares those to those paths where people didn't convert. And it starts to automatically assign credit based on which path actually made an impact in conversion. When was the conversion rate lower when this, this particular interaction wasn't present? Highly, really, really powerful stuff, available previously in DoubleClick and in Google Analytics Premium only. Um, excitingly, we've recently announced we're bringing data-driven attribution to AdWords. So data-driven attribution you'll have all available within your accounts within the next few months. And if a lot of your marketing spend does sit within AdWords, it can really bring you a great added level of efficiency. If you do need to look at other channels, Facebook, Twitter, many, many others, you still may want to use premium, but a great addition to AdWords and AdWords capabilities. You can see that it's not quite here yet. This is the Merchant Store AdWords account. Um, and what we, what we can see is though we can compare already what is the, the kind of performance across the five more simple models. You'll also be able to see data driven there. And then we'll also release the functionality where you can create um, automatic bidding based on any of these attribution models. So whatever is most relevant to you, you'll be able to, to bid towards that directly without any work in the background or without any uh, difficult calculation. So that's all well and good, but what if you really do need to have the cross-channel view? What if you need to see all of the different channels that interact? Well, you do get this very nice report in Google Analytics Standard, which can show you um, some lovely channels. They seem quite interesting, and you can see how many times a particular channel assisted and how many times it delivered last-click conversions. Uh, you also get these amazing assist ratios, which show you how much one channel is better than another, potentially, in terms of delivering assist. And you can use this to try and uh, rejig how you might use your, uh, or uh, allocate your marketing budget. But what many people aren't aware of is that you can actually really customize this. Um, so this, again, is the Google Analytics store. And I went through and spent about an hour trying to say, well, how would I try and get this into a, a much more useful view that would tell me much more about my advertising? Um, so I created, clicked to create a new channel grouping, and you can see one there. Um, and that changed the view from this to this. Um, you can see that I can name social uh, brand paid search, generic paid search, uh, referral, display. I could include here any uh, comparison sites that might be uh, using our pro or promoting our products. Unfortunately, none of them were. Surprise. Um, but I can really separate this by the search engines that are valuable in my market, uh, whether that's Cessna in the Czech Republic or, or Google. You can really get this view in a very granular level, and you can do 25 different channels in any particular analytics view. You can also then use this same kind of channel grouping to see individual user paths. 
And this is a really great way to get started with attribution because if you start from your own data and you start understanding real insights. So let's take a look at line 42. We have a user path that completed 125 conversions where the first click and visit was from Google Organic, the second was on Facebook, and then there was two visits direct to the website before the conversion happened. In Google Analytics, this uh, credit would go to Facebook. Yay, Facebook. Well done. Thank you for all those sales. Um, if we take a look at line 47, we see something that you wouldn't normally be able to attribute credit for, which was we had some clicks from uh, YouTube, 111 sales involved, where the last converting um, channel was organic. So that helps you understand the value of, of YouTube and what it can drive that you may not see in, in typical reports. Um, the super secret line is line 50. Line 50 gives us a sense of when someone saw a display impression and then came via Google Organic, via Facebook, via any other channel and converted. Anyone can be whitelisted to have um, display impressions from the Google Display Network and TrueView included in their accounts. And if you use Google Analytics Premium, you can integrate with DoubleClick and get display impressions for everything that you buy in DoubleClick. So enormously powerful, can really help you understand what channels work together and how they can really drive things forward. Uh, you can use this to customize attribution models, as I mentioned. You can really start to say, okay, we know that YouTube is great, but we want people immediately to go to site, and that's where it really drives value. Um, when we come to some of the more complex topics, um, we, we want to solve the attribution challenge for mobile. We want to help you do that. Um, some of our solutions here um, can really do that by allowing you to overwrite the cookie that we have in Google Analytics with your own unique, non-personally identifiable number that relates to a customer record in your CRM or in your customer data database. Um, relatively simply, it allows, as soon as a user has signed in or self-authenticated on your site, you can stitch those sessions together and know this is the same person. Um, you can also then start to use that for retargeting and do that across device. It's not a solution for everyone. We know uh, you've told us this. Um, and it's sometimes challenging to get users actually to authenticate in a, large, a, a high enough level. But I'll go through this in a bit more detail because it's an exciting piece of functionality. If it's not a solution for you, don't worry. Our final slide will talk about what alternatives exist if this isn't the case. Um, but we've seen a number of great case studies where users have been able to do this and where our customers have, particularly in Europe. So West Wing are a, a German furniture retailer and they created a signed-in experience on site and were able to, to allow their users to sign in, self-authenticate, and buy across device. Um, the customers that we see that are doing this really well are offering their uh, website visitors really strong incentives to sign in. There's genuine benefits from things like very strong loyalty programs to immediacy effects to abilities to qu very quickly click and collect, even do things like have a persistent basket across devices. Um, so it's well worth thinking about this before you go towards implementation. How are you going to really provide value to your visit website visitors so that they see the value in signing in? Um, one thing, if you have the ability to actually pass this information back to Google Analytics, you can not only pass back the, your unique user identification, non-personally identifiable again, but you can also pass back information that you know about them your own customer segmentation, and pass that straight into Google Analytics. So in this case, we're passing back customer lifetime value. Um, we're also passing back a couple of other things like the number of years this person has been a customer with us. And again, then you can use this for retargeting. So if you have a customer who's five years with you or a group of customers who are five years with you and who buy every year, maybe you don't want to acquire them again. Maybe you want to exclude them from some of your campaigns. All of that is possible within Google Analytics, within either a CSV upload or via an API. Um, very excitingly, we launched our first ever case study of offline to store in Google Analytics with Gallery Lafayette, uh, sort of sta or a standout French retailer. Um, they started to associate purchases with a loyalty card into their CRM data, and then we're also able to associate signed-in users on Google. If you search and think with Google in France, you'll be able to read all about this case study in French, uh, but I'll give you a quick English language version if anyone wants it. What they found from this was that 20% of their physical store sales had an online interaction across some channel uh, prior to purchase. 20% of those purchases um, started on a mobile device. And 50% of the mobile, um, mobile sessions that were started converted in day. So really, really strong example of exactly 
how important mobile is for physical store retailing. And thank you very much to Gallery Lafayette for sharing that. And the other big learning that they had which was that when they accounted for the in-store effect of digital advertising, they saw a return on ad spend increase by 2.4%. So not, not insignificant and a bit of a game changer in the way that they would be able to acquire new users via digital. So again, all well and good, but what if my users don't sign in? Um, I can feel people being a bit frustrated if that's the case. Um, so Google uh, last year released something called Causal Impact, which is an R-based package that allows you to infer statistics and use experiments, controlled experiments, to determine results. You can do this to understand advertising impact, not just digital, digital impact. You can use it for television's impact. Google has used it for many years prior to releasing. And what it essentially does is it allows you to create two groups uh, of users, site visitors, um, or sales, even sales uh, information, and you can split them by time and location and create a time series where you match test and control together. You then think about either your campaign launch or uh, maybe it's a new website design, anything else. Um, and you see what is the difference in performance between test and control. And you're also even able to match to what was the predicted performance. Because we have a time series where we have strong confidence that these two will behave very similarly, we're actually able to tell the difference. This is fairly cutting edge stuff. It's not easy to do, requires a little bit of knowledge of statistics. The Khan Academy have a really, really great online course if you are interested in getting started. Um, what we've also seen is that other companies have started releasing these too. So Facebook, Etsy, uh, Cloudera have all released their own um, R-based packages that help you really understand and tease out um, impact from your data in a very clear scientific way. Yeah. It's a very exciting place to be. We've recently published some really great materials giving guidance on how to create and run these experiments. What are the common pitfalls that we see? What are the challenges? So feel free to go to Think with Google and prove marketing impact. Uh, we were beaten to it though by Airbnb. Um, Airbnb used a similar type of package to start to understand how their um, improvements in website design drove value for their, their visitors. And if you go to nerds.airbnb.com and search for control experiments, you can read all about what they've done. So that's it from us. Uh, I'm going to hand back over to Vanessa to sign off. Thank you.